Hello everybody. Welcome to today's video where we will be focusing on how to handle yourself in court. Su juris. Su juris is a Latin phrase which means of one's own law, of one's own right. And we are providing a video series that will empower and educate people on how to present themselves in court and have a full understanding of everything that's going on. So today we are calling video number two uh, Sue Juris presenting yourself in court number two, courtroom staff, area, and etiquette. Learn about the typical courthouse, who's inside, and what are their roles and functions, the physical layout and areas of a courtroom, and the rules, customs, and etiquette that are the basis for interactions therein. And specifically, we will be covering <clears throat> An overview of different courts, state courts. Um, we'll be covering a typical courthouse, the clerk's library, uh, the law library, courtrooms, other offices, uh, the courtroom players, the judge, the judge's court clerk, law clerks, the bailiff, the court reporter, interpreters, jurors, <clears throat> parties, witnesses, attorneys, and spectators. We'll be covering the courtroom and its physical layout, spectator area, jury box, jury room, witness box, judge's bench, judge's chambers, clerk's area, counsel table, and the well. And then we'll be getting into courtroom rules, customs and etiquette, dress and business attire, be courteous to everyone, especially court personnel, check in when you enter the courtroom, stay close until your case is called, speak to the judge respectfully, don't speak directly to opposing counsel, find out about special procedures, don't speak to the judge <clears throat> about the case without opposing counsel present, never speak to jurors about the case before the verdict, be discreet, and ask for help if you are treated badly. So we're gonna pull up a screen share here for one of our favorite law pages, which is Sue Juris Law for Beginners on Facebook. This is a secret group. You will need a special invite to be added to the almost 5,000 people who, people who uh, are daily discussing legal strategies and sharing knowledge with one another. So feel free to contact me, uh, David Andrew Bryson on Facebook. I've also got another account under David Bryson. You can always uh, send me a friend request uh, or an email, and I'll be happy to add you to that group. So let's get right into this today. <clears throat> Representing yourself in court can be like traveling to a different country. Courtrooms, like nations, have unique rules and customs and even a somewhat difficult, different language. Just as with traveling, a successful courtroom experience depends on knowing where you want to go, what the rules are during your journey, and what to expect when you get to your destination. If you think of this video series as your travel guide to the world of lawsuits, this video is the part that explains the duties and functions of the various people you will encounter, the lay of the land, customs and etiquette of the natives, and tips for dealing with them. An overview of different courts. Federal courts decide two kinds of cases. Cases involving federal laws or the U.S. Constitution. And cases where the parties are from different states and the amount of money in dispute is more than $75,000. In the federal system, there are three levels of courts. District courts, where most trials occur. Courts of appeal, which hear appeals from the district courts and the U.S. Supreme Court, the highest of the federal courts, which hears appeals in a few cases of its choosing. There are also some specialized courts within the federal court system, such as tax and bankruptcy courts. State courts. State courts decide all the matters that are not covered in federal courts. State courts handle disputes involving state constitutions and state laws covering a wide variety of subjects, such as contracts, personal injuries, and family law. In some cases, either a state or federal court can hear a case. State court systems have a variety of different names, 
for their courts. Many, but not all, states have two or more kinds of trial courts. The lowest level courts are often called small claims, municipal, city, justice, or traffic court, all of which have fairly tight limits on the types of cases they can hear. The next level of trial courts, often called superior courts, typically handles larger civil cases, serious criminal cases, and most divorce and other domestic cases. In addition, some states have separate courts that handle only very specialized types of cases, such as juvenile or probate courts. These may be divisions of a general trial court. Trial courts are where most court cases begin and end. And end. The next level of court in most states is the Court of Appeal, which can review trial court decisions. And last is the highest state court, often called the Supreme Court. In New York, however, it is called the Appellate Division. State Supreme Courts, like the U.S. Supreme Court, generally choose which cases they will hear from among the many requests they receive. They choose the cases that deal with important legal issues, such as those that affect large numbers of people, those that deal with new or conflicted areas of law, and those that test the constitutionality of laws. To appeal a case, to appeal a case means to go to an appellate court and ask it to review and overturn the lower court's decision. Usually you can appeal only if you think the trial court made a mistake about the law that affected the outcome of your case. You cannot appeal just because you don't think a judge or jury made the correct decision. A trial court is often called the finder of fact, and an appellate court almost always has to accept the trial court's factual conclusions as true. See video 20 for more on appeals. This video series only deals with court cases. You can see uh, more about civil and criminal cases in video number one. A good resource, a good resource uh, on this information is um, to get the book Law and the Courts, a handbook about United States law and court procedures in the American Bar Association. A typical courthouse. Before looking inside a courtroom, let's consider the courthouse as a whole. A courthouse is, in essence, a public office building for judges and their support personnel. Different courts are often located in different buildings. For example, the criminal court may be in a different building than the civil court. Inside the main entrance to a courthouse, you will often find a directory that lists particular courtrooms or offices. To locate the room you need, however, you may have to ask a guard because courthouse directories tend not to be user-friendly. They usually don't list helpful information, such as where you must go to file legal papers or get information. And they often don't say where places such as the cafeteria or law, law library are located. Court personnel assume that lawyers, the courthouse's main clientele, know such things already. You may feel a little lost or intimidated, especially on your first trip to court. The corridors full of busy lawyers dragging huge briefcases, jurors roaming in bunches, and the occasional armed guard standing by can be rather imposing. It may help to know that you are not the only one who feels out of place. Because little effort is expended to orient the newcomer, new lawyers often get lost too. Of course, this lack of even minimal hospitality tends to hit self-represented parties a bit harder. It may help to remember the foreign country analogy. Think of this as a very strange land where the people have a different culture and language. Learn their ways by putting aside any shyness you feel and asking for help as soon as you need it. If you don't understand the answers, just keep asking. The courthouse is a public building supported by your tax dollars. Tax dollars. You have the right not only to be there, but also to ask as many questions as you want. Try not to get frustrated or angry. At times, court personnel can appear hostile, even when they don't mean to be simply because they are busy and usually overworked. Also, too often they assume that everyone who appears in court is experienced, and they don't take a little bit of extra time necessary to orient people who are representing themselves. With some patience, you will learn your way around the courthouse, and soon enough you may look so much like you know where you are going that people start asking you for help. Beefed up security. As you enter some courthouses or courtrooms, especially in larger metropolitan communities, you may have to pass through a metal detector. Like airports, courthouses are now concerned about people bringing weapons into the buildings. There may also be a guard on duty. 
Because of the metal detectors, there may be long lines to get into the courthouse, especially between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m., when courts tend to start their business hours. So leave plenty of time, and leave behind any metal or electronic objects you do not need. Cell phones are banned in many courthouses, but you may be allowed to carry a cell phone so long as it's turned off. The clerk's office. One of the most important offices in the courthouse is the clerk's office. It's often located on the first or main floor. Typically, the clerk's office is where documents relating to all the cases pending or deciding or decided in a courthouse are filed and stored. If one building houses two or more courts, such as a small claims and a civil court or a federal district and a bankruptcy court, each court will have its own clerk's office. That's because each court has its own filing and record keeping procedures. You'll have to locate the clerk's office for, for the court hearing your case. <clears throat> you will need to go to the clerk's office when you file legal papers it, for your case. You may also deal with the clerk's office to check out court rules and procedures throughout your case. For example, you will go to the clerk's office if you need to file documents such as the, a pretrial motion, a request for a court order discussed in video 7, or to get a subpoena, a court order to appear in court. You can also review documents in your own court file, a master file that typically includes all documents filed by you or your opponent or issued by the judge. Waiting in line at the clerk's office. At many clerk's offices, as at the post office or bank, you'll probably file papers and talk to clerks over a counter or through a window. And also, as at the post office, there may be bureaucratic details like rigid hours and different windows for different services. For example, even if you've been waiting patiently in line, the clerk's office may close at lunchtime, or you may belatedly learn that you waited in the criminal instead of the civil clerk's line. To avoid such problems, call ahead for information about hours and the specific procedures you must follow to file papers for your civil case. Once you get to the front of the line, be sure to be polite. The clerk's office personnel can help or hinder you, so it pays to try to get them on your side. Understand, however, that some clerks are prejudiced against self-represented parties. A few even post signs warning, warning you not to ask questions because they don't practice law. So if you run into someone who is hostile, you must remain firm and not become intimidated. You are entitled to the procedural information you need, provided in a language that you can understand. If you don't get it, ask to see the supervising clerk. Caution. Don't confuse the clerk's office and a judge's clerk. Each judge or courtroom usually has an assistant called a clerk, and that clerk may even have an office, but that is not the same as the central clerk's office in the courthouse where documents are filed and stored. You will likely have to consult both the general clerk's office and your judge's clerk as your case progresses. The duties of a judge's clerk are discussed in the courtroom players. <clears throat> the law library. Many courthouses contain law libraries that are open to the public. The first day you go to the courthouse, it may be a good idea to locate the law library, find out its hours, and walk through to take a look. <clears throat> you will learn more about using the law library in chapter 20, in uh, video 23, but the more comfortable you are there, the easier it will be to use. Often several courthouses rely on one central library, and a few states don't provide courthouse libraries at all. If you need to consult some legal research materials and your courthouse doesn't have a public law library, <clears throat> ask someone at the clerk's office or an attorney you pass in the hallway where the nearest public law library is located. It may, for example, be at a nearby law school. Courtrooms. The most important part of the courthouse is its courtrooms. We'll explore the inside of a typical courtroom in detail in the courtroom and its physical layout. But first, a few words about the outside. Judges usually have their own regular courtrooms where they hold trials and other public hearings, and the judge's name and number are usually posted on or next to the courtroom door. Most courts prepare a calendar each day listing the scheduled court hearings and post it on or near the door of the courtroom. And calendars for all courtrooms are usually posted in or near the clerk's office. A judge may be assigned to different courtrooms on different days, 
and other calendaring changes may occur. So it is good practice to verify the time and place of your court hearing, both at the clerk's office and at the courtroom. Here's a tip. <clears throat> a courtroom by another name is still a courtroom. The word courtroom may not appear on either posted calendars or the courtroom doors. Some courts use other words such as department. For example, you may see a sign like this outside a courtroom. Department number one, Judge Suzanne K. Almost all trials are public, so unless there's a sign to the contrary, it's fine to walk into a courtroom, sit in the spectator section, and observe. Always enter quietly so as not to disturb ongoing court proceedings. Other offices. Courthouses contain offices for court personnel from judges to secretaries. They may also house the offices of local officials, such as the city or county attorney and public defender, and law enforcement officers, such as the sheriff or marshal. Courthouses sometimes contain office space for legal newspapers, that is, newspapers that feature articles about current cases and advertisements for lawyers, legal secretaries, court reporters, and other legal services. It's unlikely you'll need to deal with any of these offices personally. Here's a tip. Don't forget to eat. It's hard to function on an empty stomach, so you may want to find out where the courthouse has a snack bar or cafeteria. Many do, but the location is often so obscure that you wouldn't find it on your own. The courtroom players. You need to know the identities and roles of typical courtroom players, if only to know whom to approach for advice when you have questions. The judge. The judge is the person usually wearing a black robe who sits on a raised platform at the front of the courtroom and presides over pretrial hearings and trials. As their principal duties, judges conduct hearings and make rulings on pretrial motions and discovery disputes, preside over pretrial conferences and facilitate settlement conferences, control the, the trial of your case subject to legal rules of evidence and procedure. They also make legal rulings, such as deciding whether you can present a particular piece of evidence in court or not. And when there is no jury, they decide who wins and loses and how much the loser must pay in damages. And finally, when there is a jury, judges instruct the jury as to the law it must follow in rendering its verdict. Here's a tip. <clears throat> a judge by any other name is still a judge. The words court, bench, magistrate, commissioner, and justice are sometimes interchanged with the word judge. Justice typically refers to a judge on an appeals court or on the US Supreme Court. So if the judge asks you to approach the bench, that means that the judge wants you to step up close for a private conversation. You'll refer to the judges as your honor, judge, or the court. For example, you might say, I ask that the court, meaning the judge, instruct Ms. Loretta Charles, a witness the defendant intends to have testify later on today, to leave the courtroom immediately. Some judges hear criminal matters. Others conduct only civil or non-criminal proceedings. Still others hear only cases involving juveniles. Judges' powers depend on the courts in which they preside. For instance, Judges in small claims courts usually have power only to grant a limited sum of money damages, often between $2,500 and $15,000. <clears throat> Judges in appeals courts do not conduct trials at all, but review decisions of trial courts. <clears throat> See video 20 for more on appeals. In large communities where there are many judges, some judges may conduct hearings on pretrial concerns, but not the trials themselves. See video seven. It follows that a different judge may be assigned to your case during different parts of the litigation process. For example, one judge may rule on your opponent's pretrial motion to dismiss the case, another may conduct settlement negotiations, and still another may preside over the trial. Cases are sometimes decided by someone known as a Judge pro tem, short for the Latin judge pro tempore. Generally, a judge pro tem is a practicing lawyer who is appointed to serve as a temporary judge. You almost always have a right not to accept a judge pro tem 
and to insist on a regular judge. However, if you exercise this right, your case may be delayed. If you agree to have your case heard by a judge pro tem, the pro tem has all the powers of a regularly appointed judge. In some courtrooms, the judge is called a commissioner or magistrate. A commissioner or magistrate, typically an employee of the court system, is appointed to act as a judge and hear cases relating to a particular subject matter or in a particular court, such as a city, municipal, small claims, or traffic court. Magistrates are appointed by judges of federal district courts, federal trial courts. They hear pretrial matters in civil and criminal cases and conduct some trials. Sometimes the magistrate will hear a case, if the parties agree, and make a recommendation to the district court for a particular ruling. The district court judge must then approve and sign the actual court order. Next, the judge's court clerk. The judge's clerk, also called the court clerk or the judge's court clerk, is a member of the court's clerk of the court clerk staff who works for a particular judge. The judge's clerk has many duties, including preparing and maintaining the judge's calendar, often called the docket, which, like an appointment calendar, lists the dates and times for trials and other matters. The judge's clerk nominally, normally rather, sits at a desk in front of or next to the judge's bench. You would typically have to check in with either the clerk or the bailiff when you arrive in the courtroom. The judge's clerk also retrieves court or case files that are maintained and stored centrally in the main clerk's office. Your case can file consists of the papers, briefs, pleadings, and other documents relating to your case that have been filed that is delivered to the court's custody to be stored as permanent public records. During trial, the judge's clerk keeps custody of exhibits, administers oaths to witnesses, judges, jurors, and interpreters, and generally helps the judge move cases along. If there are papers you must present to the judge during a court proceeding, you may be directed to hand them to the court clerk, or sometimes the bailiff, who will then pass them on to the judge or file them in the court file. For example, you may need to show the clerk a copy of a subpoena that you served on a witness who did not appear. When a judge makes a final decision or issues an interim order, that is a decision on an issue that arises before the close of the case, the judge's clerk typically prepares the order for the judge to sign, although some judges ask for attorneys or self-represented parties to prepare the orders. Law clerks. Many judges, especially in federal and higher state level state courts, have law clerks. While the judge's court clerk helps with scheduling and administration of the judge's courtroom, the judge's law clerk helps with the legal substance of the cases that come before the judge. Law clerks are often recent law school graduates. To assist their judge, law clerks research the legal issues presented by the parties, assist the judge with legal questions that arise before and during trials, and help draft the written orders or opinions that judges sometimes produce to explain their rulings. <clears throat> Getting advice from clerks. Generally, you are not supposed to discuss the merits of your case with any court personnel without the other side present. If you do, it's called an ex part contract. And clerks cannot give legal advice. However, you may ask commonplace procedural questions of the judge's clerk or law clerk, such as how you might get an extension or continuance for a court deadline you will not be able to meet. The judge's clerks, both the court clerk and law clerk, can also be a very valuable resource for routine questions about local court rules and special procedures unique to your judge. For example, a judge may want an extra copy, called a courtesy copy, of pleadings you file with the main clerk's office to be sent directly to the judge's courtroom. If you are concerned that your question may be improper, try explaining the general idea of what you want to ask before you proceed with the question, with the full question. The most important thing to remember is to be especially polite to the judge's clerk and law clerk. They work with the judge on a daily basis and they will not hesitate to tell the judge when someone has been rude to them. Next up, the bailiff. 
The bailiff, often classified as a peace officer and commonly uniformed and armed, is an official of the court, a part of a wide range of duties. The bailiff, one, maintains order and decorum in the courtroom, for example, by removing disruptive spectators from the courtroom and ordering people to silence their cell phones and possibly confiscating them. Two, takes charge of juries, for example, brings them into and out of the jury box and deliberation room. Third, escorts witnesses into and out of the courtroom, and finally, hands exhibits to witnesses who are testifying if the court clerk does not. Next, the court reporter. In most courts, a person called a court reporter records every word that is said during any official on the record proceeding in the courtroom. During the proceeding, the reporter may read back testimony of a witness or a statement by a lawyer or self-represented party upon request of the judge. If you want something read back for your own or the jury's benefit, you may ask the judge for permission to have the court reporter read it back. In a few courts, such as small claims and some lower level state trial courts, a court reporter is used only if the parties request one. And some courts now record proceedings with tape recorders. Someone, often a clerk, still runs the tape recorder so that statements can be played back at the judge's request. Here's a tip. Speak clearly for court reporters and tape recorders. When you're in court, stand tall and speak up so that the court reporter or recording system can correctly record your statements. Speak slowly and directly into the microphone if one is provided. Have your witnesses speak up too. Avoid interrupting except when it is essential, such as when you need to make objections. It's difficult for a court reporter and sometimes for a judge or jury to sort out what's said when two or more people talk at once. Court reporters will prepare a transcript booklet of what was said at a particular court session upon the request of a party or the judge. It is often necessary to get a transcript if you plan to file an appeal. Court reporters typically charge by the page to prepare transcripts. Depending on the length of the hearing, they can be costly, several hundred dollars for just a few hours of court time. At the end of the court hearing or other proceeding, ask the court reporter or a clerk or bailiff in the courtroom for information on how you can contact the court reporter or obtain to obtain a transcript. Or leave your own phone number and email address with the clerk with a note indicating that you want to buy a copy of the transcript and would like to be notified when it is ready. Next up, interpreters. Interpreters translate for witnesses and parties who have difficulty speaking or understanding English. Interpreters are sworn to interpret accurately. Parties typically pay for interpreters in civil cases. A one-day trial may cost between $150 and $300 for common language, such as Spanish, and much more, and as much as three or four times that for less common language. In most cases, you cannot bring in just anyone, such as a friend or a relative, even if that person would be well qualified to, to interpret. If you or a witness need an interpreter, <clears throat> ask the clerk's office, your judge's court clerk, or your legal coach how to arrange for a court certified interpreter. <clears throat> Next up, jurors. Jurors evaluate evidence and render verdicts in both criminal and civil cases. They are drawn from the geographic region in which the court is located typically called to be available for a couple, time, a couple of weeks at a time. Potential jurors may never actually serve on a trial, either because they are never needed or because the judge or a party dismisses them. When jurors do serve on civil trials, their job is to decide whether claims are factually valid and if money is awarded, how much the winning party should receive. In limited situations, judges can overturn a jury's verdict or modify the amount of damages the jury awarded. In typical civil jury trials, there are between six and 12 jurors and a few alternatives. In case a juror gets sick or is unable to finish the trial, <clears throat> in contrast to criminal cases, which often require a unanimous jury, most states allow civil cases to be decided when three-fourths of the jurors agree. Many cases are not decided by juries. They are handled by judges alone, 
In a few situations, you are not a, allowed a jury. For example, judges alone handle many family, many family law. <coughs> <coughs> Rather, <clears throat> judges alone handle many family law, bankruptcy, and pretrial matters. In other types of cases in which having a jury trial is an option, it's possible that neither you nor your adversary may want to have a jury. Video 10 has tips on deciding whether to try your case before a jury. <clears throat> Next up, <clears throat> parties. Parties are the people or organizations, such as businesses or nonprofit groups, in whose names a case is brought, usually called plaintiffs, or defended, usually called defendants. Cases can involve multiple defendants and sometimes multiple plaintiffs. As a party who is re presenting yourself, you may be called a pro per or pro se party. Next up, witnesses. Two kinds of witnesses may appear at a trial. Ordinary witnesses and expert witnesses. Ordinary witnesses. Most witnesses testify under oath to information they have that they know through personal knowledge. In the language of the courtroom, they may testify only to things they have perceived with their own senses, meaning what they have personally seen, heard, smelled, tasted, or touched. For this reason, they are sometimes called percipient witnesses. <clears throat> For example, a bystander at a car accident may come into court and say, I saw the red car go through the stop sign and hit the blue car. However, if the owner of the blue car went home after the accident and told his neighbor, who did not witness the accident, all about it, the neighbor could not testify about how the accident actually occurred. The reason is that the neighbor did not perceive the accident with his or her own senses, <clears throat> except for being reimbursed for the, co for the costs of coming to court a limited allowance for things like mileage to and from the courthouse. Ordinary witnesses cannot be paid to testify. You can obtain a subpoena, a court order, to compel a witness, to compel a witness to come to court and testify, but typically only if the witness lives or works relatively near the courthouse, in some courts within 100 miles. For more details on subpoenas, see Video number 12. Expert witnesses. Witnesses who have specialized knowledge that is relevant to the case can testify as expert witnesses. A judge may rule that a witness is qualified as an expert before that person can testify based on special knowledge or training. Experts are not just medical doctors or rocket scientists, but also people such as auto mechanics, building contractors, and computer programmers. Experts can testify under oath about what they have personally seen or heard, like ordinary witnesses. More commonly, however, experts give their opinion about what conclusions can be drawn from testimony given by non-expert witnesses. Unlike other witnesses, experts are almost always paid for the time they spend preparing for and giving testimony, and they are reimbursed for their costs of coming to court. Next up, attorneys. Attorneys, also called counsel, counselors, or lawyers, speak and act on behalf of parties. Attorneys generally handle most aspects of the case for the parties they represent. For example, during trial, attorneys may do the following. One, question witnesses to bring out testimony that helps the client's case or refutes the opposing party's evidence. Two, Attorneys object to improper testimony, exhibits, or arguments of the opposing party, or arguments of the opposing party. See video 17. And thirdly, attorneys argue to the judge or jury how the facts and law show that the attorney's client should win the case. Attorneys also perform many functions outside the courtroom, such as conducting legal research, advising clients on strategy, drafting legal documents, and negotiating settlements on behalf of their clients. Attorneys also sign and arrange for documents to be filed with the court and served on or delivered to the other party and witnesses on behalf of their clients. In some courts, attorneys may be asked to draft court orders after a judge has made a ruling. This may be the judge's final decision or an interim decision 
such as a ruling to exclude a certain document from being admitted into evidence. As a party presenting yourself, you will perform many of the functions that a lawyer does for a client. If your opponent is represented by a lawyer, you are expected to deal with the lawyer and not directly with your adversary. This means you should, you should make phone calls to the attorney, not your opponent. And when you serve legal papers on your opponent, you should deliver them to the attorney. Attorneys are forbidden by ethical rules from contacting someone represented by an attorney directly. However, because you are not a lawyer, <clears throat> there may be an exceptional situation in which, if the opportunity arises, you will want to bypass the lawyer and talk to your opponent directly. For example, in an effort to settle the case. <clears throat> Another ethical rule requires lawyers to communicate certain important information to their clients. For example, if you make an offer of settlement to the attorney, the attorney must communicate it to the client, even if the attorney thinks it's a bad proposal. So you need, <clears throat> so you need not to be concerned that your opponent is not getting information that you're communicating to the lawyer. Even when you represent yourself in court, you may want to hire a lawyer as a coach to help you find the applicable law and advise you on particular questions as your case progresses. See video 23 for more on legal coaches. <clears throat> and the final <clears throat> type of person you will find in the courtroom are spectators. Most court proceedings are open to the public, so family members, friends, and even total strangers may watch hearings and trials. You may find it helpful to enlist supportive friends to come to court with you and perhaps assist by carrying things and taking notes for you. Spectators must usually sit in the back of the courtroom behind what is called the bar, actually a low partition or gate, that divides the area immediately surrounding the judge and jury from the rest of the room. In some courts, and especially in cases of spousal battering or sexual harassment, judges may grant permission for non-lawyer supporters to sit next to you at a counsel's table the place in front of the courtroom where lawyers and parties sit while presenting their cases, discussed in the next video. To provide moral, though usually not verbal, support. If this is something you feel will help you present your case more effectively, ask the judge for permission. Moving on to the courtroom and its physical layout. Even though, as a self-represented party, you are not expected to understand court rules and legal principles perfectly, you should know where you will sit and stand and where everyone else belongs when you go to court. The more familiar you are with the lay of the land, the more easily you will find your way around and the more confident you will look and feel in doing so. This section describes a typical courtroom layout. Well, first you've got the spectator area. The spectator area is usually in the back of the room, uh, courtroom, often separated from the rest of the courtroom by a bar or low partition. Members of the public sit in this area, as you will if you visit a courtroom. Upon arriving in the courtroom, attorneys, parties, and witnesses usually check in with the clerk, then sit in this public area until the names of their cases are called by the judge or clerk. The jury box. The jury box is where jurors sit during the jury selection and throughout the trial. Traditionally, it seats 12 jurors, although many states now use smaller juries in civil actions. The jury box area remains empty when there is no jury or the jury is out of the courtroom. The jury room. The jury room is separate from and often behind or adjacent to the courtroom itself. During jury trials, this is where jurors go to evaluate the evidence, deliberate and decide on their verdict. The witness box. This box-like area, also called the witness stand or the stand, is located to the left or the right of the judge's bench on the same side of the courtroom as the jury box. Witnesses sit here when they testify. Before they are asked to, test Before they are asked to testify, witnesses either sit in the spectator area or wait in the corridor outside the courtroom. If the judge has excluded them from the courtroom until they are called to the stand, it is fairly routine for witnesses to be excluded, kept out of the courtroom until it is their turn to testify, so that their testimony is not influenced by what other witnesses say. 
but you may have to ask the judge to direct the witnesses to wait outside. Let your witnesses know ahead of time that they may be excluded so that they won't feel that the judge is somehow biased against them if they are asked to leave. You might suggest that they bring a book to read while they wait. The judge's bench. The judge's bench is the raised wooden desk or podium at the front of the courtroom where the judge sits. No attorneys or parties may go near the bench except upon the judge's request or by asking the judge for permission to approach the bench. During a jury trial, it's fairly common for the judge or a lawyer or self-represented party to request a short meeting at the bench, sometimes referred to as a sidebar conference, to discuss some point outside the jury's earshot. Judges' chambers. The judges' chambers are the judges' private offices, often a room adjacent to or behind the courtroom. Judges may ask you to have a conference in chambers during a trial or other proceeding if they want to go off the record and have a quiet place to confer. Judges use such conferences for various reasons. For example, to admonish one or both sides for inappropriate conduct in a jury trial or to urge one or both sides to settle. If you are asked to go into chambers and are uncomfortable with whatever is said, you may request that the conference be put on the record. That means that the court reporter will come in or you will all go back into the courtroom so the reporter can record what is said. The clerk's area. The court clerk usually sits on the side of the judge's bench opposite from the witness box. The clerk is usually present during the court's proceedings. The counsel table. This area, which includes a table or two chairs, is and sometimes a podium and microphone is where attorneys and parties sit during trials and hearing on their cases. In most courtrooms, you make arguments and question witnesses while standing at the podium or microphone, though some judges may allow you to remain at the counsel table or stand closer to the witnesses. You'll take your place at the counsel table when your case is called. If the counsel tables are labeled for plaintiff or defendant, sit at the appropriate table. If they are not, the plaintiff usually sits on the side that is closer to the jury box. The well. The well is a space between the counsel table and the judge's bench. The court clerk and the court reporter may sit in the, in the well area. Don't go into the well area unless the courtroom is so small or the architecture is such that you must pass through it to take your seat at the counsel table. You may also have to go into the well very briefly when you first arrive in court to check in. Courtroom rules, customs, and etiquette. In presenting yourself in court, you may feel a bit insecure, especially before you have had a chance to observe other courtroom sessions. This is normal. You are not trained and experienced in conducting trials, and you may have been treated with hostility or heard stories about other self-represented parties being treated that way. Again, just as if you were traveling to a distant land, you will have a more pleasant and productive trip if you follow local customs, in this case, courtroom etiquette, and are as polite as possible. This section explains some of those customs. Dress in business attire. Generally in court, you should dress as if you were going to a job interview or a professional job, suits or other professional looking clothing. It's better to overdress than to underdress. Federal courts tend to be more formal than state courts. In lower courts, such as traffic, municipal, or justice courts, however, it's appropriate to dress as you normally dress for your work, particularly if you come to court directly from your job. For example, if you are a contractor, nurse, or security guard and are coming from work, you do not need to change into a suit. Be courteous to everyone, especially court personnel. Of course, it's always good to be courteous to others, but it's particularly important in court where you are likely to need a bit of helpful advice from time to time. You may also need small favors, such as a five-minute recess or for the clerk to notify you if your case is called and you need to be out of the courtroom for a minute to use the restroom or make a phone call. And you will have questions, even the most experienced attorneys do, such as how to label exhibits or file legal papers. Simply put, Court personnel are much more apt to grant your requests and help you out if you are polite and respectful.
Check in when you're when you enter the courtroom. When you enter the courtroom, check in with the court clerk. Give your name and case number. Ask whether the court is on schedule and ask when the clerk believes your case will be called, meaning the judge is ready to hear it. If court is in session when you enter the room, wait until the judge takes a break or pauses long enough after a proceeding is finished so that you can discreetly hand the clerk a note with your name and case number saying you want to check in. Stay close until your case is called. Clerks usually have a good handle on the judge's schedule, but sometimes things go faster than anticipated because other parties aren't ready or a case is settled at the last minute, or the judge may call cases out of order. Also, some courts schedule hearings in blocks so that several matters are all set for the same time. In these courts, judges often take the routine or quick matters first, and the cases or hearings they feel will take up more time after all the routine items are finished. Sometimes, judges put cases on first call or second call, meaning earlier or later in the time block. And the lawyers or self-represented parties can request that their case be heard earlier or later, depending on their schedules. For all these reasons, if you need to leave the courtroom even for a minute, it's best to let the clerk know where you are in case the judge is ready for your case sooner than expected. Often, the judge will not wait until you are ready. Rather, often the judge won't wait if you're not ready. <clears throat> when the judge is ready to hear your case, the clerk or the judge will call out your name and the names of the other parties in your case. You will stand and say that you are present and ready to proceed. When the judge or clerk motions for you or tells you to come forward, you will take your seat at the council table. Master calendar systems. In some courts, the first judge you are assigned to, the first judge you are assigned to go see is not the judge who will be presiding over your trial, but the master calendar judge. The master calendar judge is a bit like a tour organizer who takes a bunch of tourists into one central office first and then assigns them to particular tour guides according to what sites they will see, what language they will speak, or how big the group is. The master calendar judge evaluates a whole slew of cases to determine how long they will take and how complicated they will be. Sometimes the judge tries to help the parties with settlement, settlement negotiations. Then, based on the cases and on the availability of particular courtrooms, the master calendar judge assigns those cases that are ready for trial out to other courtrooms. In assigning the case, the judge might say something like, Smith versus Klotchman to Department 2, trailing. This means that your case will be heard by the judge in courtroom 2, but that it will trail or follow one or more other cases. The clerk's office should be able to tell you whether your court uses a master calendar system, and if so, how it works. Speak to the judge respectfully. As a general rule, you should always stand when addressing the judge. Only if you see that attorneys routinely talk to the judge while seated at the council table, as is the practice in some state courts, should you sit while you speak to the judge. Even then, it might be worth showing the courtesy of standing until the judge says you may be seated. If you are unable to stand for medical reasons, tell the judge that at the outset of the proceedings. Always call the judge your honor. Do not say sir, and especially not ma'am. In court, by long-running tradition, your honor is the neutral, respectful term used by all. You are not giving anything up by using it and are, in fact, expected to use it. Even if the judge appears to be barking a bit at you, continue to be calm and polite and do not raise your voice or bark back. Don't speak directly to opposing counsel. When your case is being heard, always address the opposing attorney or self-represented party through the judge, not directly. For example, say, Your Honor, this morning, Ms. Ellis stated here in court that she would not be calling any other witnesses. Now she has stated that she intends to call two additional witnesses. I ask that they not be allowed to testify. Do not turn to Mrs. Ellis directly and say, You said you want to call any other witnesses. 
always address or refer to attorneys, parties, and witnesses by last names. For example, Mr. Neustadt or Mrs. Doherty, even if you have talked a lot on the phone and you're on a first name basis with the person, use last names in court. This maintains the formal, respectful courtroom tone. Find out about special procedures. All judges follow the same broad procedural rules discussed in this video series. Nevertheless, some judges have their own preferences as to the details, and will be and you will be well served to learn these. One good way to start is by watching your judge in action before your day in court. Another is by talking with the clerk or a lawyer who has appeared before your judge. For more information on researching your judge's background and style, see video number 10. Don't speak to the judge about the case without opposing counsel present. Legal rules prevent ex parte or one-sided contacts with the judge. You wouldn't want the other lawyer to talk to the judge out of your presence. You should follow the same rules. Normally, if a judge or one party suggests a meeting either at the judge's bench, a sidebar conference, or in the judge's chambers, office, both sides must be represented. Sometimes it will be up to you to help arrange a mutually convenient time for such a meeting. Never speak to jurors about the case before the verdict. If you are conducting a jury trial and happen to pass one of the jurors in the case in the hallway, a nod, smile, or hello is permissible. But it's very important that you do not enter into any discussion with a juror or comment on your case within earshot of a juror. Be discreet. Do not discuss your case with witnesses, family members, or anyone else in any public place where you can be overheard, such as the elevators, restrooms, or cafeteria. The lawyer for your opponent is likely to know many people in the courthouse, and your words may, quick, may quickly be passed along. Ask for help if you are treated badly. Once a trial starts, it is normally too late to request a different judge. See, see video 10 for information on challenging a judge before trial. This does not mean, however, that you are helpless if you are treated in a demeaning or hostile way. For example, if you ask a simple question and are given a stern le lecture that, for example, only idiots appear in court presenting themselves and that you should immediately hire a lawyer, it's pretty clear that you are facing a steep uphill battle. In such a case, you can try any of the following approaches. One, ask to speak to the judge privately. If the judge agrees, tell the judge that you are doing your best to follow the rules and point out politely that you have the right to represent yourself and to be treated respectfully. Two, write a letter to the presiding judge, head or chief judge of the court. The clerk's office can tell you who this is. Describe the specific instances in which you feel you were treated unfairly and ask that another judge be assigned to your case. Third, file a written complaint with a state agency that has the power to discipline judges. Most states have such an agency. It may be called the Commission on Judicial Performance or something similar. You can also contact the state bar if your state has one. Such agencies have the power to investigate complaints against judges and even to remove them from the bench for serious or repeated violations of rules and judicial decorum. And fourth, if all else fails, consider filing a written motion with the court requesting a mistrial. The judge can be disqualified on the grounds that the judge's bias or prejudice against self-represented self parties is making it impossible for you to have a full and fair trial. If the judge's clerks or law clerks treat you unfairly or rudely, follow similar guidelines. First, try speaking with them in a polite but firm way. If they do not improve, write a note to the judge or presiding judge if you don't get anywhere with your judge about the problem. All this said, although extreme rudeness should be addressed, it is an unfortunate part of the process that, that you must expect some amount of rude and abrupt behavior and you must develop a thick skin. Lawyers are used to being combatants of sorts and discourse between lawyers is often less than civil and courteous. People in this sort of battle mode 
can forget common politeness. Therefore, do not rush to assume that anyone is out to get you personally. Just take the steps outlined here to address concerns that the behavior of someone else in your case is affecting or will affect your case. So, let's see. That will be the end of our video for today. Thank you for joining us. And our next video, number three, will be on starting your case. I will be discussing whether you have a good case, uh, whether the lawsuit's timely, uh, how much time you have in which to file, when the clock starts ticking, um, which court has the power to hear your case. We'll be talking about jurisdiction, federal court jurisdiction, dual jurisdiction, state court jurisdiction, and personal jurisdiction. And then finally, we'll be addressing beginning a lawsuit with the plaintiff's complaint, summons, and defendant's response. So look for that in video number three in this, our series on Sue Juris presenting yourself in court. Uh, thank you for subscribing to my channel. Please share this video with other people who you hope it might benefit and be of uh, help to. And uh, we offer this in the hopes of restoring our constitutional republic uh, where we're encouraging all people everywhere to study the elements and rudiments of law, to be conversant with basic law concepts uh, because we have some work to do in this time of great restoration. Um, so thanks again, look forward to being with you in our next video and have a wonderful and blessed day.